Every time our athletes walk into this weight room, they're going to be pushed to the max. Let's go! Let's go! The barbell hasn't changed in over 100 years. I can take a 25-pound plate and we'll go out on the turf and I'll, I'll have you hating life. We talk about straining your gut, pushing past that comfort level. I want a lot of energy. What better breeding ground is there? Hey guys, welcome back to Iron Game Chalk Talk. I'm your host, Rob McKeefrey, and this is episode number 280. I want to thank you guys for listening each week. We truly appreciate those of you that like and share and comment. It just helps us continue to highlight the great people we have in our profession. also want to thank our sponsors for bringing these episodes to you for free. Uh, as I always say, I only partner with companies that I believe in, uh, both the people and the product. And uh, all seven of our sponsors are, are fantastic products but they they're even better people and uh, so if you're in the market reach out to them if not just let them know how much you appreciate them for being part of the show this week i'm joined by owen walker he's the founder of science for sport uh you know i've come across uh you know that's basically how we came across each other is is uh you know i came across the the, the resources that you put out and just think it's a fantastic um uh resource for the community but it's also a kind of a fantastic niche for you individually as a coach and and a sports scientist in the space and so uh wanted to have you on the show to talk about that a little bit man i appreciate you coming on no mate awesome like absolute pleasure to have the invite you know like obviously being huge names on here before and stuff like that found what you've done so no mate it's my pleasure to jump on and chat to you today so great man all right You've, been, you've done a handful of things. I mean, you've been with Cardiff City Football Club. You're a sports scientist with Welsh FA. I'm sure there's some other stops in there along the way. You know, which, you know, which one of those stops or, or, you know, which experience have you had that best defines you as the, as the person you are today? Um, it's always a difficult question, you know. Um, I'd say I, I think really like one of the big things that carved – the, the route I've taken in developing science for sport and stuff like that was um, so when I first got the job at Cardiff City. Um, so I've basically been through the interim route, there's a number of different things, and then was offered the position, come straight in, and then um, there, there's pretty much like a, just a, a big slap in the face moment when um, a line manager, not soon after, not too soon after I'd just been hired for a position, was like, right, you want to spend equivalents probably about 80,000 80, on GPS devices and stuff like this. And which one should we buy? What's the most accurate? Like, what's going to give us the biggest bang for our buck and stuff like that? And I was just like, wow, all right. So I'm soon just being lumped in with this position. I've got, I've got to make a huge decision financially and for the academy for the players and for me that moment was like like I don't want to be um not back I don't want my line managers to think I'm incapable of doing the job sure um they were they were literally just asking and then there do you know what I mean like tell us what's best and I was like okay well I don't know exactly I had to just be honest I'm always one of those people like you just if, if you're unsure about something you just be honest but look I'm going to find the answer I'm going to do this so that, that was very much my approach to that particular situation and so I went away and just started looking around like I was looking and this is like rolling back a few years you know this is before the proliferation of information online so really the only place I could find all this information was journals uh, like in actual research studies so like I, I straight away in my head then I was like we, like we need a decent resource where I can go quickly I can see the reliability validity I can see an in-depth um, analysis on the micro sensors whether it be the accelerometer the gyroscope you know the GPS unit or the mag magnetometer so um, that for me as a defining moment because that's how it carved out the rest of my career, like from there and developing science and sport, do you know what I mean? Like it was just a big slap in the face. And it it was just that, I guess it was like a, I, I didn't, I'm trying to think of a word here. Like it's, it's, I was felt exposed, do you know what I mean? Like being under the cost, like asking a big question, just got the job. 
back and tell us. And I wanted to be an expert. I wanted to be perceived as an expert. You know, like I didn't want the vulnerability of just losing, having my staff lose the faith in me and then even worse, like at a particular time, any of the players, you know. I feel it would be easier to, to redevelop your, um, your position with the staff than it is with the players. As soon as you lose the players, I feel like then it's, it's a hell of a bigger task to like regain that trust you know so i wanted to be an expert and i wanted to perceive, uh, be perceived as an expert as well so as a big moment that was it for me purely because that card is exactly where i've gone now because i was like right we need we need this kind of information same applies for like cold water immersion and ice baths you know like um i wonder how many practitioners have in their mind like do they know the difference in the severity protocols, you know, like do they know the difference between a three times five minute at 10 degrees at waist height versus like a two times eight minutes at chest height, you know, right. and those, those kind of things. I wanted to clarify those, those particular like things, that sure. all the questions I had in my head. So yeah, like, uh, as a shape, like a shape and experience and a carving of my path, big slap at the moment. I, I, Literally put it down to that, that particular time, yeah. So, uh, I mean, that would be a hard question, yeah. maybe a long way to go about it, but yeah. Well, those aha moments, you know, those the, those are defining moments in everybody's career, and, and having the opportunity to, uh, you know, be put in a position where you're going to get asked those types of questions and be uh, put in, in kind of an expert situation. Every every coach goes through that. You never really quite feel like you're ready for the the next opportunity. Um, and some things you just can't go through until you're sitting in that chair and you're, and you're forced to make those types of decisions. But yeah. uh, what you said about being honest and, and, and uh, vulnerable and, and sharing where you're at, I don't think you ever go wrong with that. I don't think you ever go wrong with the players. I don't think you ever go wrong with your coaching staff. As long as you say, hey, look, but I'm gonna, nobody's going to work harder to find the answer. You know? And I think that's, that's the critical piece. Having the, the opportunity to go through that is, is yeah, absolutely a defining moment and has uh, put you down this path, which is, which is a pretty cool path. Before we, we talk about science for sport, I want to talk a little bit. Uh, you know, one of the most powerful questions that I ask in these podcasts, I think, is the biggest mistake you've made and, and how you've learned from it. And, you know, I think that there's probably somewhere in there of how you've gotten to science for sport as well. Yeah, um, yeah. It's funny enough because I've seen the, the previous episodes of the Talk Talk, and um, and yeah, the, this this particular this particular question, and scratching my head really, like what what is biggest mistake? Um, and I think, uh, I don't know. Again, like a, it's a really difficult one to to pinpoint exactly and and this is a point as well for me is like it's almost I, I feel we need to as we like kind of develop coaches and the, like the industry moves on and stuff like that I feel we're starting to really register the difference between like mistakes and just learning curves more as well do you know what I mean like I don't think because obviously when we use the term mistake people are try and avoid it you know like oh they made this mistake I'm gonna try and avoid it and that but they're just like shaping experiences like Sure. You have to go for it. It's like um, your parents tell you, don't touch the fire because it's hot, but come on. We, we, everyone wants to feel what it's like, you know? So obviously we have to make our own mistakes and go through. So there's no point in trying to skip past mistakes because they're so good for self-development, you know? Um, so there's no, I don't see any real major value in trying to skip past mistakes. I think they're all just learning curves. It's like failure is part of success. No one went out and like, had a free kick and put it in the top corner the first time they ever tried. They failed a thousand times before they eventually got there. You know, it's all part of the shaping experience. Um, me, biggest mistake maybe, um, when I went into the position at Cardiff, um, I was kind of young myself, maybe 23, something like that. And felt maybe I was too close for the players when I first went in, like the one of the age groups, you know. Um, I'd say... Because, I would, oh no, I would have been younger, I guess 20, 21, 22 or something. I was working with the under 21s. Right. So like I was very yeah. much their age group, you know, and I, I found it difficult to, to really separate myself. My, my dream 
as a career was always to be a footballer, soccer player for all the Americans. Like that was always my passion and my dream. And so when I went into this environment, like I very much just saw my life in their hands. And funnily enough, to make it worse, like I walked into the changing room one day at the like at first, first team and the 21s train in the same facility, the academy is a separate facility. I walked into the change rooms and funnily enough, I, I didn't even know he played there at the time. Um, a player I used to play with at an academy, a professional club academy. So you come through the academy system, you get a professional contract, you work with the first team. Um, he was actually playing for Cardiff City first team at the time. I walked into the change room, I was like... Pfft. Hello, mate. Like, how are you? I haven't seen him in years. Um, so, like, very much, you know, we were in the academy system together. Now he's a player, and I was an intern at this time, you know. So I found it very difficult to kind of separate myself and bring myself here, if, if you like, with an all like an authority as a coach. So biggest mistake I'd say was was that in particular, but. Um, Again, I, and I think I heard it on a talk talk the other week about almost there's like a unique situation you have as well to really kind of develop, well, to develop a unique relationship with the players because you're at their level. When you become older, and maybe I haven't quite got there yet, is you find it hard to put yourself in the same level as the players because you're almost like a different generation, you know? So um, call it a mistake, call it a learning curve. Whichever, but yeah, for me, I think it was that one. Yeah, I think a lot of coaches, especially young coaches that get opportunities young, go through uh, that. I, I did the same thing at 22 years old. I was a head strength coach in the NFL, in the NFL and and um, you know, those are the guys that you know. I mean, you, you have a passion for the sport. You have a passion for you know, uh, you know, for strength and conditioning, and you would naturally gravitate to those those people as your friends, you know, those are, you know, yeah. you gotta, I got to draw that line uh, between coach and, 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 uh, and player. And it's, it's, it's oftentimes a hard thing to do, but um, I think, you know, carrying yourself, being consistent, making sure you don't cross the lines outside of the walls of the, the weight room or the, or the building, uh, you know, making sure that they, I use the word coach, you know, as a coach McKee for your coach Mac from the get go, even when I was, 23 years old yeah. when, it was, when it was something where people would uh, <laughs> say, hey, you're by your first name. That guy knew you by your first name. You know, which, I, which is, is, that's it. Sorry, mate. I'll, I'll just tell you, it's a difficult one in the UK, a good coach, because we never use those terms. You know, If I turn around and said that, they'd be like, mate, <laughs> <laughs> you bite. We're not having it. Yeah. But, yeah, sorry, mate. Carry on, carry on. No, but I think that's – but, I mean, finding the ways to, to position yourself as an authority – that young, I think, is is uh, it's critical. You know, you got to be careful. You can't be who you're not. You can't try to be pompous or, you know, be, you know, pound your chest and say all of a sudden I'm above you. But there's ways to separate yourself um, and make sure you don't cross those lines that you can't get them back. You know, so if you're going out drinking with them after after a big win, you know, you, you, you know, and then you turn around the next day and you're you're trying to get after them about completing the set or completing a workout, it's probably not going to go over as well, you know? Uh, yeah. you got to find that. But I, 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 can, I can identify with that quite a bit. And, I mean, so so for me then, like, it's, it's one of those. You can learn – obviously, you can learn something from everyone in the industry. You yourself, being a while, absolute veteran and a gun in the industry. Putting the question back to you, what would be your number one advice for separating yourself, you know, building that authority, but – separates so i'm sure there's a lot of young coaches who are listening so what would you say yeah i think that i mean that was definitely something that i did early on expect and i guess it's probably unique to the united states but you know using using the term coach was big for me and, and you know kind of defining and drawing that line between when we're in the building this is this is coach mckeefrey when we're out of the building this is ron mckeefrey or ronnie mckeefrey or, or whatever i think that's one way i think being consistent with your message um, but not trying to, you know, and, and I think, you know, like you said at the beginning, I mean, being vulnerable and just, you know, Hey, you know, guys, we're all the same age. We all like the same stuff. We all, but at the end of the day, we all want to win, you know, and, and just as you're working very hard to be the best and be a pro at what you're doing, I'm doing the exact same thing. 
in my career. So don't put me in positions where that line gets blurred, you know? And I think if you have those conversations and, and when there's those boundaries are tested, I think that's an important part of the process. I, I, I think that that last point's awesome um, about just telling them your message, you know, what you're trying to achieve in your career. Make that marry it up with what they're trying to achieve. And go, look, we're on different paths. I may have been on your path. It didn't work out for me. You've you've continued on it, so that's great. But I'm on my path and see me as a professional trying to get there. I, I love that message. Yeah, I think that's great. I think you know, and then, at the end of the day, you you may have to to say, hey, look, I, this is my career. This is not. I, I mean, we're not. But it comes down to it. I you know I'm a representative for the organization. And, um, you know, you might, you might have to, you know, to play that card, that coach card every once in a while and, you know, call somebody out or turn somebody in or whatever it may be. But, you know, you got to be serious about what you're doing too. I mean, you're, you're making a decision when you become a, a professional as a strength and conditioning coach or sports scientist or whatever it is that um, you're now an employee and you got a job to do, you know? And so I think that sometimes that's, it's hard to do, you know, sometimes you want to let a guy slide. Maybe, maybe he missed weight by a pound or a kilo or something. And you gotta be, you gotta be consistent. You gotta call him out. And if not, if you, if you start to kind of blend up, blur those lines, people will take advantage of you. Yeah. Awesome. That's great. Man. I wanted to dig into, um, you know, science for sport. I mean, I think it's such a fantastic resource and, and, uh, I want, I want to, you know, before we talk about it, I want you to kind of explain it in your own words for the, the person that started it. Yeah, so, and obviously I, I don't jump on podcasts too often. Probably really the biggest one, the only one I've done apart from with Christian Woodford in Australia. Um, and so I don't get a lot of opportunities to explain the message, why we did it. Um, Really, to to flip back on the story about buying the GPS units and um, the position I was in, the vulnerability that I felt, really, that is exactly why we started it and what we're trying to achieve. So basically, science and sport, what it is and what we're trying to achieve is to supply in the trench coaches, those who are coaching day in, day out, those who are working practitioners every day with high quality information that they can trust and get the answers that they have in their head so they can carry on writing programs and coaching athletes, you know? So flip it back again, that position I was in, which GPS unit should we buy? Okay, right. Leave it with me. I'll come back to you tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. with an answer. Go away. Go to Science for Sport. You're going to go there. You're going to learn about GPS units, all the micro sensors that are in them, the combination about the algorithms that each of the different companies and manufacturers use, um, and get an overall picture. And then it puts you in a better position to, to make a decision. Again, likewise, whether it's cold water immersion um what contributes to the intensity or severity of the protocol whether it's water temperature duration of the immersion the depth of the immersion um all of those things contribute towards the intensity and severity and then um it's about collating the information and just portraying it in a very easy to understand um, simplistic manner basically like cutting straight to the chase so right. we want to supply in the trench coaches high quality answers as quickly as possible simple as that yeah, I think it's I think it's fantastic and, and if you you know we're going to link up all the all the links in the show notes but um, if you haven't checked it out it's it's it's, it's a great resource um, and, a, and a good mission I, I, I came on late, honestly. I, I, you know, I just found it not too long ago. And uh, I know it as it stands right now. I know it's not a finished product by any means, but I know where it stands now. Where did it start? Was it just you putting content out? 
because now you've you've got this team of of people that are, <laughs> that are contributing. Yeah, so um, it did just start with me, you know. I always had the I don't mind like I got other friends who are strength and conditioning coaches, and I was like, look, I want to start this resource. Do you want to join me? And really, the message was always, ah, oh, nah, like can't be bothered or didn't want to do it. It's not something they're interested in. So yeah, it started out as just me. Um, and basically it just kind of adapted. So what I began to realize was that um, keeping up, so the research is there, say for cold water immersion um, or GPS units. But when I started writing the articles for the website, what I quickly found was there's like over a thousand sports science studies published every month. Um, it, that began, began to get a little problematic like for the articles because the articles need to be continuously updated. So for instance, I wrote one, I say recently, it's maybe about eight months ago now on velocity-based training. It's like the whole science behind velocity-based training, you know, talking about accelerometers and so on and so on about like uh, minimal velocity thresholds, what they are and, all that kind of stuff. Now, that's great, but then you've got new research being published every month, you know, about like whether the mean concentric velocity is consistent if you're using like a dynamic back squat versus like a pause at the bottom versus a swing back squat and free weight and so on. So that's when I was like, right, well, like we need something like a monthly research review that the practitioners could use. And in order to put it together, I had to build a team. Like it was as simple as that. So it developed from just me to building a team to put together the monthly research review. Um, and basically, they, I have practitioners, we call them pracademics because they need to be able to understand the research and yeah. translate it as quickly as possible for, for the coaches who are working day in, day out delivering sessions. So we built a team of pracademics, those from coaching science, strength and conditioning, nutrition, um, physiotherapy, and collated the digest based on that, basically. And that's how the team has developed off of the back of that. And then we've got the, the Facebook community as well um, for all the support. So all the coaches who are members and readers of Performance Digest. They all get to network inside the community and discuss with the um, research reviewers and ask questions and so on, you know. So, like, recently, a, a good question we have recently, and, and this is just goes to show, like, the need and necessity for it. Um, someone's looking to buy, like, opto, like an opto jump or some sort of, like, testing for jumping, like, testing equipment for jumping, basically. Right. And right. didn't know which one to buy. Um, chuck it in the group okay tons of answers tons of responses other practitioners i'm using this one i think this one's great i think this one's not so good great price too expensive blah blah, blah. that sort of response you know so that's been awesome yeah i i, I would echo i mean it's, it's such a, a great resource and i think the key part of that is i love the pracademics term i love the fact that you're talking you know about practitioners um, that are people that are in the trenches that that are interpreting the research as, as, as from the lens of a strength coach, you know, from the lens of somebody that's that's actually using it, as opposed to somebody that's just either supported by a manufacturer or um, you know, or is looking for an academic angle or whatever it may be. I think that this is key. I think um, what my concern would be, and I think this is where a, a lot of strength coaches kind of lie on that line of, you know, why even really, because there's a thousand plus research studies coming out every month and, and half of them don't are not applicable or, or more than that. It's not applicable to my situation. Why stay up with the research versus maybe, you know, just conducting your own, you know, uh, research in terms of answering questions that are specific to your team and your situation. Um, and uh, and using that as a competitive advantage, even. Yeah. So, are you are you asking the question of why stay up 
to date with a research like that versus doing your own research and try to well, I think it's find what's useful for your team. Is that the question? Is, is you know, it's such a daunting task, right? Is trying to stay up with the with the with um, uh, the research, and then you know, oftentimes it's a battle of PhDs, right? It's it's one PhD saying something, and then another yeah. PhD turn around and refuting that with their own sort of study, you know. And staying up with that is obviously a great thing to do, but it, you know when it comes down to sometimes that that this you know uh, rhetoric that goes back and forth as a coach, you're just like, man, I got I got a team to get ready, you know. Um, you <laughs> yeah, know, yeah. I think I, I guess the answer I would imagine is that the fact that it's been put together by practitioners, the the content that's being produced is stuff that practitioners would be interested in. Um, yeah. But how do you, you know, I guess my, you know, how do you weed out what goes in and what goes out? Yeah, so the quality assurance process really, it comes down to our research reviews are very much the quality assurance process, you know. So it's on, it's on them pretty much to decide um, what makes a good study, what makes a bad study, um, what makes a useful study as well as being good, um, and really deciding which one goes into there. So... Um, they have certain kind of criteria and things they'll be looking at in order to pick a good study. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and based on that criteria, what they determine to be a good study, they'll then use, well, they'll filter it down and then decide out of those ones which ones are most applicable for coaches working day in, day out. So, for instance, there's three strength and conditioning articles in each monthly review, you know, so um, it's not too like it's not really overwhelming as a coach. Um, and to read the whole thing start to finish is under 60 minutes, so you basically you can do your hours worth of continue well because it, it accumulates, you can do your continuing professional development through it, like NSCA, ASCA, and those kind of things. So, um but the, the point being really is you can read the, the strength and conditioning section in 10 minutes, three articles. Um, and from that, you can pretty much just decide or pick and choose which ones you want to read, learn a little bit. About. You don't need to apply straight away because I, I, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm very much, um, <laughs> I, I believe in the whole paralysis by analysis. And I think every coach out there knows the same thing when trying to write a program. So, um, I'm fully aware of that and this is why the Performance Digest kind of just gives you what you need to know and how to apply it so you can make the decision then you read it, okay this is what I'm going to do shall I apply it straight away you, you don't need to apply it straight away you've just got up but then you know okay well next cycle I might try and creep it into the program or something like that, do you know what I mean, give it a little tester um, but it's one of those, it's just about continuing um, your own professional development, growing your own cerebral and ticking off CPD, you know, like, because we have to keep pushing the envelope of performance um, and growing as practitioners. And, and for me, like this, so going back again, like to the situation I was in, I wanted to be an expert. And for me, there was a few criteria I had in my mind that would make an expert. So I, I'm quite a critical guy. So I was thinking, right, I want to be an expert. What does that look like? Um, for me, you need to be like, uh, one of the things is a pioneer, basically a visionary and a pioneer. A visionary is to me is someone who understands where things are going. So if this technology is going to develop. Maybe we can incorporate it into the program and, develop our athletes this way. A pioneer is someone who actions those particular things. So if you want to be an expert, bottom line is you've got to know where the industry's going and apply it as well. So the performance digest helps you to do that. And that's where where I see it slotting into the, the industry, you know. So. Yeah, I, w I want to come back to that because I, it's such a great, uh, being a visionary and a pioneer, there's a lot to dig in with that. Before we do, though, I want to, just, I mean, you mentioned that there's three uh, SNC journal summaries in, in each one. 
give the give the format again. I, I I can't remember the exact format of the of the digest, but it's three. That it's, I think it's a couple physio, right? Come yeah, on. yeah. So it it's three strength and conditioning. Yep. Three fatigue and recovery. Three technology and monitoring. Three nutrition. Three injury prevention and rehab, which is technically a physio. And one coaching science. Gotcha. That's great. I, I think, again, I mean, uh, from a practitioner standpoint, you got other practitioners that enjoy, I mean, going through the research. I mean, that's a big part of it, right? You got to enjoy going through it, which first, I personally don't. Uh, <laughs> So you got people that are going through that are practitioners that are going through it with a filter of other practitioners. And so they're, you're getting down to, you know, just you know, three that would three in, in each of those areas or, you know, most of those areas that are the ones that stand out the most that maybe had the biggest impact. And I think that that's, you got to have a filtering system with as much information that's out there these days, you got to have some sort of filtering system. And I think that this does a great job of that. But one of the things you said, the visionary, the pioneer, and I think, you know, this is something that I, you know, I faced a lot in my career. Um, you know, I think, what, you know, when I started this podcast, people thought I was crazy. When I, when I wrote a book, people thought that was kind of weird, you know. Um, there's a difference between um, people that take action and don't take action. You know, I mean, this is an idea. I mean, I'll be, I'll be quite honest with you. This is an idea similar uh, in concept that I had, you know, 10, 15 years ago, but never acted on it, you know, and, and yes, yet, yeah. we've done a great job of taking that and acting on it and creating a great, um, uh, you, you know, product around it, but also service to the community. Um, talk a little bit about why it's important to you to make an impact in the community, but then also taking action. And once you have that idea, you know, um, there's a lot of people with ideas, but there's very few people that take action. Yeah, yeah, exactly, and it, it goes goes full loop. Um, so, what impact do I want to have? Like, for me, I, I think a commonality, and particularly in Europe and in Oceania, like Australia, and New Zealand, um, for me, it's the the instability of the industry, um, the low salaries, uh, and. For me, like the industry in those in those areas of the world, like obviously it's a bit more established in the U.S. It's really kind of where it, it drove like drove out of. Um, the industries need to be substantiated a bit more and built on stronger foundations. So for me, the the long term objective is to concrete build stronger foundations to the industry. Um, it's obviously a difficult task and going about it. The governing bodies are doing a great job of it at the minute. Um, and obviously there's a lot of, a lot of suggestions on what they can do as an addition to the kind of concrete the industry. Um, so for me personally, there was another question buried in there as well. I can't quite remember what it was. Hopefully you can remind me, but to what impact like I want to have, do you know what I mean? As a visionary, I think that's yeah. We hit uh, the, the obviously the motivations behind it are you know are great. And I think there's a lot of people. <coughs> excuse me. I think there's a lot of people in our profession that that truly want to make a difference, you know. But it's having an idea and taking action. And so take yeah. us back to you know the moment where you're like, yeah, I need to do something. Nobody else is doing it. I need to do it. What should I do? Yeah. <coughs> yeah. So it was like the science is for. One was pretty much like I'm, I need to not only help myself, but help other practitioners there, you know, like they need this GPS information. They need the cold water immersion information. They need an open access online straight to the point whenever they want it. Do you know what I mean? Yep. That was the objective there in order to help practitioners um, as well as help myself, you know, like it is, well, it's part of the whole development process. You know, if you want to learn about something, it's definitely works to write a, in-depth article on it you learn a lot about the basics of it obviously then you got to apply it which is a different aspect but still you need to learn about one side in order to learn the other so um theory and practice combined together so yeah as a visionary but 
ultimately the long term goal, like I said, is to do that. And not a lot of people action on the things. You're absolutely right. And one thing I'd, I would like to see more about is there's thousands of coaches, thousands of them. And I just, I wish as well that more out of those thousands would be the change. Do you know what I mean? Like everybody wants an industry that's built on stronger foundations. I think there's no coach out there that doesn't want that. But I can't see any anyone, particularly in like private sector or anything like that. I only see the governing bodies that are trying to do something. I don't see really anyone who's actually honing down and making that their objective is to substantiate the industry. So like like I said, there's only a few like action men out there. Everyone there's a lot of idea, people with ideas, but not a lot of people making action. So being the change is a big one for me and I think what the industry can really do with is one individual or a group, which would be even better, of people who are deciding that they want to um, really push the envelope, build stronger foundations. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, you said there, uh, it's so key um, to me is, um, you know, when you teach or when you put together a resource like this, you become so much better, you know? So, like, doing this podcast for the last seven years, I've become such a better strength coach because I've connected with people all around the world, you know, um, you know, writing a book helped me refine and, and, and uh, refine and define my message and make that a little bit clearer and be able to be put into, uh, to be able to be used very easily. And I think, I think coaches sometimes shy away from, um, you know, doing those types of things, A, because it's a lot of time and effort and the, and the amount of work that goes in on, on by your part and, you know, people that put podcasts together and things like that. It's a tremendous amount of work. You know, there's just something to be said for that. But what you get in return, not beyond monetary, uh, but what you get back in return is so much more powerful, makes you such a better practitioner um, that I would, I would encourage, just like you said, to be the person, to be the change, to, to be willing to put yourself out there. And, and it's okay to walk in a little bit different lane. I mean, when you did this, there's probably people who are like, oh, that'll never work. Or, you'll, you know, um, or there's probably lots of people that told you no, you know, to contributing, you know, at the very beginning until you found your team. Um, yeah. I think it's okay to walk in a, in a little bit different lane, you know, and sometimes that's best is when, when you are outside of that and people say you're crazy, you, you might be onto something that, you know, uh, because, you know, insanity is doing the same thing over and over and not getting – uh, you know, getting the same results, right? You know, and, and that's what we've been yeah. doing as a profession is we've been doing the same thing over and over again, and we're not advancing it um, in a lot of ways. And so uh, kudos to you on that. I want to talk a little bit about the business side of this now, because I think that's something that's also oftentimes looked at as a bad thing is making money in this business outside of your core job, right? Of coaching a team or working with a program or something along those lines. And, you know, when we were doing the, you know, when you filled out the, uh, the info sheet and all that, I mean, one of the things you mentioned was your unique selling proposition, your USP. And, you know, that's something to me, I, I talk about that a lot. And even as a coach, I think you need to have a unique selling proposition. But let us, tell us what that is and, and how you kind of arrived to it for yourself. Yeah, so this is a really good question. Um, how I arrived to it for myself. So I guess – Reiterating what I said earlier, that I like I'm a critical guy. Um, when I was starting out on the journey, I was thinking, right, where do I want to be? Maybe five, ten years, and I wanted to be Premier League, English Premier League football, first team strength and conditioning coach or director of performance, high performance manager, however you term that, which part of the world you're in. Um, and so I was analytical about how you get there. What, like what makes someone, because not everyone gets those positions. And it's, a, it's like certain common characteristics, certain level of knowledge and et cetera that go into the people who make those positions. Um, and I think one of them for me is a unique selling proposition. So basically what it is and 
this applies massively to anyone who's applying for jobs. So if you're looking for a job in this industry and you're going into interviews and stuff, you need what we call a USP, unique selling proposition, hands down. It like, if uh, personally, I believe if you're going into one without one, you just blend into everyone else who hasn't got one. And in the current state of the industry, where it is and the level of knowledge around this particular topic, I think it's your one edging factor above anything else. So when it comes to interviews and stuff like that, if you try to get a job or push the envelope of your own career, um, and basically what it is is something you have and you portray that other coaches don't have or it's not particularly their strengths. Like your one key strength of your product, which is you as a coach. So, I mean, you just think of anyone in the industry that you respect and I'm pretty sure you'll be able to assign them to a particular topic, not because that's all they know about. Right. Believe me, you've got to be like a solid generalist before you can be a specialist or some people don't want to be a specialist, you want to be a generalist. Um, you need to know a lot about a lot, but you need to know even more about one particular topic if you want to develop your own unique selling proposition. So, for me, this Dan Baker, Blossom Race Training, Sophia Nymphius, Agility. Um, uh, <laughs> I've, I've got a brain block now. Uh, Brett Bartholomew, Coaching Science. Um, and this is not to say that's the only thing they know about, but they know more about this one. Brian Mann, velocity-based training, Andrew Flat, heart rate variability. Right. Each of these people that everyone's kind of certain knows who they are as their own USP. So from building your own portfolio and your own business as a coach, I think you have to develop your own USP. And for me, ones I've looked at, if I was to go um, – and think about football, then hamstring injuries would be a huge one, right? Like, if you're going to go into a job interview and stand there and be like, oh, what separates me from these other candidates is I'm an absolute gun on hamstring injuries and rehabilitation and prevention of reoccurrence, you know? So that's a big, unique selling point that puts you head and shoulders above the other competition who are applying for that particular job. So... That's the way I see it. I don't know if you see it in the same manner that coaches should have their own USP. Um, I, absolutely. I, I think, um, and I talk about this often in, in presentations I give, where it's not just credentials. I mean, a lot of people, they, they want to say, they want to throw their credentials out there as unique identifiers. <clears throat> and, you know, there's, there's a ton of people with masters and degrees and even PhDs at this point. There's a lot of people that have, ASCA or UKSCA or NSCA strength and conditioning certifications, or maybe coached at a certain level. Um, but, you know, becoming an expert in a specific area like you're talking, I think is, is definitely a way to form a USP. But I also talk about how you're uniquely you, you know, your USP, you know, it, it can be an emotional. I mean, people, people don't want to work with robots, right? They want, they want a story. They want something, you know, that's, um, that gives them an example of, of why you're uniquely you. And I often say your mess is your message. You know, things that you often look back in your life. Like for me, I grew up in a single parent home with five kids with a dad that was a, a special forces soldier that came back with a drug and alcohol problem. You know, that's something that I'm not proud of. You know, it's not something that I like to talk about, but that makes me uniquely me. And, and by, you know, being around drugs and alcohol as a kid, that's, that's stuff that our players go through or being a, a you know, single parent home. That's stuff that our players go through. So that, you know, those things stand out to a coach that's, you know, a, that coaches a bunch of people that are in a similar situation. Um, yeah. so I think it's both. I think it's becoming an expert in an area and, and being a, uh, uh, you know, being a specialist in, a, in, a, in an area, but also having a generalist mentality, I think is good. But I think it's also, you know, don't be afraid to be you. And, uh, but, but, but craft that message. You know, be able to, to be able to do that in an elevator pitch in a two minute. This is who I am in two minutes, and, and, and in a way that makes people want to ask for more. You know, and so yeah, I yeah. definitely, I definitely agree and identify with that as well. Man, we, it, it, shape, it shape you for the particular jobs that you're looking for as well. You know, like um, I'm just talking on jobs because it's a good example to use. Like, if whatever helps develop you is being uniquely you 
like you'll fit to particular jobs much better than you'll fit to other ones. Like I know, um, realistically, football is like my where I lean towards. Like that's what makes me uniquely me. You know, like work in other sports, go work in archery, but my personality, my blend goes into football. Do you know what I mean? Like so, yeah. Like when it comes to applying for jobs and stuff like that, rather than I know obviously people with just competition for jobs, but you'll find the ones that really fit to you better. Um, and for those that pretty much, my opinion is that you, you um, applications are always going to be far stronger in what you find is you, you know, what jobs you find more interest to you. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, identifying, I think that, I think that's before you can outwardly project what your USP is, you have to inwardly define what that is. Mm -hmm. And part of that is defining what your passions are, you know? And so for me, that's American football. I played it. I grew up around it. It had a big impact on my life, you know? And so because of that, that's, that's where I gravitate towards Could I, could I write a program for an archer? Sure. But it's probably not going to be with the same passion and energy as I would an American football player, you know, and and that's going to show through at some point as well. So, I, 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 I agree with you 100% on that. I think it's a lesson that a lot of everybody that's listening to this episode, you should stop, define what your passions are, what makes you uniquely you, ask some of those questions, and then turn around and find a way to be able to project that in a, in a, in a, in a crafty manner. But, um, but you've obviously done that and, and, and really have positioned yourself um, in, a, in, a, in a unique way. And I think the, and, and and you know you 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 have a lot of success when you do that. There's a lot of people that do that and, and don't have success. But when you have success with that, I think is when you you have a mission that's beyond the greater good, uh, you know, beyond yourself. You know, your yeah. your mission is to help the industry. And if you have that, you always position that up. I think you know it's, you're you're always going to be lifted up at individually as you are collectively. And uh, yeah, and and that's that's a good point. Like. The industry needs um, all all coaches. Everybody contributing to something. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't think any coach should just ride the wave of everybody else, like generating the energy. Like, I feel everyone should and can add something. So, there's hundreds of topics that people haven't started delving into, which might be your particular niche as the listener. Do you know what I mean? Like. Um, I said before about building stronger foundations. Why not make that your USP? Do you know what I mean? Think about the connections you would build globally in terms of a network and jobs. If your goal was to push the industry forward, obviously behind trying to increase the industry, you know, that's one unique selling point. 100%. So, I tell people all the time that we're in our first 100 years of this profession. So if you could go mm-hmm. back and chronicle the first hundred years of any of you know, law or business or medicine or some of these other professions, you know, that, that's the stuff that, you know, I mean, we're in the first hundred years. So everybody has an obligation during this time, I think, to put out blogs, to put out articles, to, to lecture, to um, you know, create resources of, of sorts and get the information documented and, and down so that this, yeah continue to grow I, I you know I, you're doing that in a massive way and, and Do- I, documented it's a great word to use documented brilliant word I, I I end the show with some resources here give us the best piece of coaching advice you ever received that's a good very good question um, I guess are we the same ones Maybe it was uh, uh, there's a few. Or maybe I'll, I'll I'll say the one. I don't know if anyone said it on the podcast before, probably a million times or whatever. Um, always like consider the ROI, um, return on investment of whatever you want to add to your program. So always make that the forefront. Everybody's trying to push it, the envelope and try to improve their program, improve the services to the athlete and try to find any way possible in doing it. Um, and I'm fully aware of that. Obviously, science of sport just educates on those 
particular topics like we don't say apply it we right. just say it's the information if you need it going back to the point is like if you we get coached all the time saying oh, i want to have velocity based training into the program how shall i do it um shall we do it little they really consider they're working with under 12 gymnastic yeah. athletes who have got two months gym experience do you know what i mean like what like really what's the roi of what you're trying to add the return on investment so the complexity added versus the rewards you're going to get from it so I don't see the point in adding velocity based training to that particular cohort. Like your time's better spent doing other things. So only in a given situation where you need to get a certain improvement, then look to get that technology in or apply this particular principle to your program or something. But don't overcomplicate things just to try and get a certain reward out of it. I think maybe that's a big one, you know, like be critical of everything you add to your program and think, do I really need it? They're actually going to add a positive return on investment to the complexity of that app. Yeah, 100%. Give us a book, app, and website recommendation. Book. Um, I'm, I want to guess the majority of readers, a uh, majority of listeners, at least been in the industry for a year, two years plus. So I'd say high performance training for sports. Um, as a book, I think it's phenomenal. You know, it covers a lot of different topics um, and yeah I, I, I'd have to say that one uh, website other than science for sport um, I'd have to say simply faster I think um, Carl Valle I know in particular right I think writes the majority of the articles you got a few other good ones from Derek Hansen and stuff like that there's tons of stuff on there but those are the most frequent names I see publishing stuff um, and they put out great content. Um, so then, app, audible for me. Um, definitely like spend enough time reading. <laughs> Performance Digest or articles and stuff like that it takes too much time reading. So Audible's nice just to sit there or drive and listen to knowledge bombs being slapped in my face. So <laughs> that's my that's my app as well. Um, yeah, it's good, hasn't it? Well, man, I, I really appreciate it. Like I said at the beginning, you know, we try to keep these shows at 20 minutes, but we you dive in and it goes way longer than, uh, you know, you, you want it. To, you, you, not that you don't want it to go long, but um, but I enjoy this conversation. I enjoy the message, and, and, and I think it's an important one to get out there that um, not only are you doing the, uh, your, your product and what you're doing is specifically a good thing for the industry, but the fact that you're doing it in the first place and that you're taking action and you found a niche to kind of, you know, to help the profession in general and you're, you're willing to be vulnerable and put yourself out there and, and put something out there for people um, is, is, is a testament to who you are and, and how you go about your business. And so I appreciate that. I appreciate it as somebody in the community and, and uh, uh, you know, congrats on, on all the success that's come with it. No, mate, thank you very much. And it's reflective as well, you know, like I see you've like doing what I'm trying to um, achieve with the industry and stuff like that, but far more advanced, you know, like you've been there in the years, you've done more. Um, so no, mate, it's reflective. So it's, I'm delighted really to, to jump on with you and you say that to me. So thank you very much. That's it for this episode of Iron Game Chalk Talk. Thanks to this week's guest as well as our sponsors for bringing this episode to you for free. Make sure to check out ronmckeefree.com where you can join our mailing list, find the show notes, including all the links and resources mentioned, and information about Coach McKeefree's other products. While you are there, please join Coach McKeefree in the comments section thanking our guest for sharing. If you haven't subscribed to Iron Game Chalk Talk on YouTube or iTunes yet, make sure to do so. Comments, ratings, and reviews are always welcome. Coach McKeefree can be found on Twitter at rmckeefree on Facebook and YouTube at forward slash Ron dot McKeefer. That's it for this week. Be sure to check back next week for another great episode of Iron Game Shop Talk.